So, and now, as, as Bonnie Python likes to say, and now for something completely different. I want you to take a minute and look at the picture that I've put up on the screen. Tell me what that is. It's a map. It's a map. Well, what, is, what, what else is it? It's a letter. It's a letter. You all know what a letter is, or you only do emails? Have you ever sent a physical letter? <laughs> okay, good. I'm happy to hear you. Still, there's still a generation that still sends physical letters. Yes. What's, how does this challenge assumptions and questions? It's a strange way to address it. What did you say? It's a strange way to address it. Yeah, Don was saying it's a strange way to address it. How is it strange? It doesn't have what? It doesn't actually have an address. Yes, it doesn't actually have an address. You see? By the way, this letter got there. Oh, really? Yes. This letter got here. Joe, Harriet, and Tricia's flat, flat is British for apartment. Please deliver here, flat 11 number 17. But they don't have the street name, and they don't have the postcode in London. But so this is a non-propositional, a non-linguistic presentation of an address, right? You see that? This, I, I love this. This is so interesting, right? And it got there. So we can process information in many ways. I just give this as a little, look, it's just like giving you a piece of chocolate, yes? It's just like a little, a little instance of how we can question assumptions, yes? Looks like it took a lot more effort. It looks like it took a lot more address, effort to make that map than it would to three lines the address. Yes, it probably did make more effort. But, but as it turns out, the, the the woman who made this is an artist, and she likes to send she <coughs> likes to send stuff by the mail that gets post people upset. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing she did on one of her. She had the address with another little map, and then at the bottom, she had a picture of England, uh, of the UK, where she had sort of mapped out thematically what the level of annoyance of postmen, post people, in different parts of the UK. And London was red, 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 and Edinburgh was red, red, and the red, like most of rural England was green, and that got there too. But, but, yeah, anyway, I just think this is a very interesting challenging of assumptions, yes, in our society. I mean, how many of you have ever thought, I never thought of it, to write an address not as the words, but just as a map and go, <coughs> send it here? That's kind of interesting, yes? You see that? Okay, just a little soon. Any comments on that? I told you it was now for something completely different. Yes? I don't know how she would send anything to a PO box, so. <laughs> uh, Yeah, maybe. No, well, maybe not. Maybe there are some addresses she can send it to. It's possible. Yes. Yes. So, any other comments? Maybe. I, st I want to talk about master-slave dialectic, and I know that's easily going to take half an hour. So maybe we'll just go to that. We can talk about... I hope that in section you'll pick out some key themes from this book, such as conscientious, conscientious raising. And in the very back of the book, remember how he gives us various ways that we can be more dialogical, right? Like, uh, what are his four ways? He has four. Starting on page 167, which is what I asked him to read. Do you remember? Yes, that's great. And is it Sarah? No. What's your name? Amanda. Amanda, yes. So, I right on, Amanda. Starting on page 167, <coughs> cooperation, unity. unity for liberation, organization, and cultural synthesis. And I'm not saying that every student mentor has to talk about these four things during the section, but I would hope that you would give it at least a little bit of space in your section, okay? To just 
have at least 15, 20 minutes where you're talking about the contents of this reading, particularly the positive. Like, what are the propositions he gives of how we can have a better educational system? Okay. What, are, what is his proposal? All right? But I won't have so much time today. Can I turn? Oh, I take it out. Is that all right? OK. And then we need to get this screen up somehow, because now I need to board. Unless there are any comments. And I know that the screen is yeah. there. Okay. OK. Thank you. There, let's turn it off. So any, I do, so I am a philosopher, roughly, by training. I'm also a biologist by training. Um, my formal degrees, I'm both a philosopher and a biologist, and I guess a historian and philosopher of science. Um, I'd like to take a moment to talk about a very important idea, which is in this book, and which you really can't understand Marxist thought without. And it's called the master-slave dialectic. It's kind of funky. Some of you have heard me talk about it. I recognize Allison from intro, and you were an in intro, but I'm sorry. I didn't. Megan. Megan, right. Which, which, was it last quarter? Yeah. Yeah, it was, right. Sorry. Yes. Um, so you've heard this before, and you can chime in when you think I'm off. Anyone else from intro last quarter? Oh, yeah, you were there. Well, Amanda. Amanda, yeah. Me too. Yes. You were in intro? Who else? Was there? Yes. And I don't remember. Nicole. Nicole, right. Right. Okay. Um, so you have heard this before, and some of others have too. You, I guess you can't understand oppression or Marxism or uh, class struggle without understanding how Hegel thought of masters and slaves. And Hegel was this thinker, a philosopher, an incredibly influential philosopher, German, who actually had Marx in his classes. So he taught Karl Marx. He also taught some other so-called left Hegelians and right Hegelians, which we won't get into. It doesn't really matter. These are names that won't necessarily ring a bell to you or you. Um, but uh, he had this idea, he, it's kind of weird. He basically thought that there was like a pre primordial consciousness. But it wasn't really consciousness yet. It was just this guise. In German, the word is geistes, which means spirit, okay? There was this spirit which was trying to become self-conscious. But the only way it could become self-conscious was by going, one, through a process which had an end. So there was a telos. Telos is Greek for an end, an aim a goal, okay? And this process is kind of like a spiral, but I only have two dimensions. And what consciousness did was it sort of created its antithesis, or its opposite, and then together with what it was, which is the thesis, it made a synthesis, which was a new thesis. I'll give you an example in a second. So the, the model for, for Hegel is that you start with a thesis, which then is opposed to an antithesis that develops through it, which then together resolve and form a synthesis. Okay, it's all kind of weird, I know. But we'll get there. And there are various stages. And so he thought for, um, let's not talk about religion right now, but here's a story he starts, perhaps, well, it is the most famous book he wrote, 
the phenomenology of spirit, or sometimes translated into English, the phenomenology of mind. Um, but it's Geistes in German, which is spirit. He starts early on in that book, and it's a very difficult book, and you know, it's something as philosophers were, some of, many philosophers never even touch it, especially philosophers living in the US, but philosophers living in European continental Europe would be crazy never to have read the phenomenology of spirit. But he starts this book with an, a, a fable, a story. And the story is about a master and a slave. And he does actually use words which roughly translated into English are master, slave. They're also sometimes translated as lord, bondsman. So it's master, slave, also sometimes translated as lord, bondsman. And the story he very simply tries to tell is about how the relationship between the Lord and the bondsman evolves. Okay? And the story is initially these two entities meet each other and neither of them is Lord or bondsman yet. Actually, let me take it back even further. He, he, he's a little bit metaphorical at times here. But you start with a unity. Okay? That's the first stage of this process. You start with a unity where there's only one entity. And that's like the primordial spirit, there's only one entity. But because difference, because dichotomies and distinctions, thinks Hegel, are just so central to the universe and how we think and what we are and how the absolute he talks all the time about the absolute. That's this spirit. Sorry, I'm stepping on. The absolute is this spirit. And it's a single kind of thing. But what ends up happening is because difference is just sort of intrinsic to nature, oneness becomes two-ness. Things divide. So we go from having this unity to having a duality. And, says Hegel, the thing about duality is that it is unstable. Because there is in, in, immediately and invariably a power struggle ensues between these two things. And this is what he calls the struggle, he calls it this, the struggle to the death. These two things struggle to the death in their power stones. Okay? Now, three things can happen. One can obliterate the other, and then we're just back to unity. And then the process would start again. They both annihilate one another, then we have nothingness. But Hegel doesn't believe there can be such a thing as nothingness. And we would just go back to the primordial consciousness and then the thing would start over. Or what almost typically happens is one imposes its will and its power on the other. So in this struggle to the death, someone wins. So we go from the nakedness of having an undifferentiated duality to Um, this duality starts by being undifferentiated. And, but through the struggle to the death, you now have one individual that's on top and one individual that's below. And it's this... So, well, there, I'm, I'm just going to say there's the winner who becomes the powerful one and there's a loser who becomes the meek and oppressed. Now, I'm going to try to make this simple. The story is way more complicated, OK? This story between winner and loser, Marx used it to talk about class struggle, socioeconomic class. So who are the two, what are the two main classes for Marx? 
bourgeoisie. The proletariat and the bourgeoisie. The bourgeoisie are the capitalists or the elite. Those are the winners. And the losers are the proletariat. Those are the workers working in the factory, working on the construction sites, tilling the land. Peasants are also as complicated. Um, I, Marx is mostly talking about workers. He's not talking about peasants. OK, Simone de Beauvoir. So that's Karl Marx, who you all know, or you should know. So you should at least say you know. <laughs> now, Simone de Beauvoir is someone you probably don't all know. It's, it literally means pretty sight. Beauvoir. Okay. Simone de Beauvoir adopted this model to talk about sex relations and gender. For her, the man was the winner and on top, and the woman was the loser and the meat. And she wrote a whole book, it's a beautiful book, called The Second Sex. And there's a reason it's called The Second Sex. Women are the second sex, according to Simone de Beauvoir. A third figure is Franz Fanon. Picture here. I'll, I'll, set, I'll give this to you a little later. Franz Fanon took the same model of Hegel and applied it to race relations, in particular the black and the white. And that's the title of his book. It's in French too, but in English the title is um, Black Skin, White Masks. Okay? And his idea again is to analyze the relation between races where the white man is the winner and the black man is the loser. Now he does have things, what's interesting in his book too, is he, he, def, he has chapters on the white man as he relates to the black woman, but then also the black man as he relates to the white woman. So he doesn't have the same story to tell about gender as he has about race, okay? But that's beside, we can't cover everything in this class, and we're not going to cover it. But I would recommend, for those of you interested, to at least have a look at Simone de Bois, who talks about sex and gender relations, and Fanon, who talks about race relations in black skin, white masks. And he talks a lot about colonialism and how colonialism oppressed, European colonialism oppressed people of color throughout the world. Okay? And Marx famously, of course, it, well, there's a gazillion things. If you want to start somewhere, just read the Communist Manifesto, or do yourselves a favor when you're an undergrad, and read the first couple chapters of the Capitol. That's his famous fact work he wrote while he was sitting in the British Library in London. Um, okay, three, class, sex, race, all built on Hegel's master-slave. Now surprisingly, Hegel, being this abstract philosopher, doesn't, have, doesn't talk about race, sex. That's not how he was defining it. He was trying to tell a whole story about all of evolution of human culture. But um, I'm not done. I'm just telling you these are examples. I'm giving because I know you like examples. We all like examples. These are examples of winners and losers, okay? And that is an outcome after the struggle to the death, okay? So we enter into a new phase. Are there any questions so far? I should breathe and I should let you ask questions. Yes, yeah, so there will. So the struggle to the death, that implies an end point. Yes, right? yes, good. And what, are, what is the end point? Um, the obliteration? Yeah, either the death or obliteration of one of them or both of them, or getting to the, the power structure. Oh, okay, so the, the, the power struggle is different than the struggle to the death. Correct. Okay, the okay, power, sorry, no, 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 this is a, it's great you're asking that question. The power struggle is what happens once the struggle to the death ends. Before the struggle to the death, they're both like equal power, so they're trying to destroy each other. There's no, they're undifferentiated. It's not like one is on top and one is below you. Look, it's a fable. Yeah, I mean, I, look, Hegel's trying to tell a story. 
and, and the unity, we start with unity because, and, and I think that's intuitive for many of us, right? Does that help? Yeah. Yes. John. How do you feel about the current political landscape or if to <laughs> let's not do well, okay, yes. I, I, I'm afraid of time. Oh, my, okay. Time is my fear. Yes. But what's your question? Like would, so in the current political landscape, Hegel would call that that we are in the midst of the struggle of the death and one of the parties will become more dominant than the other. Yeah, something like that. Okay. So but we're we're still Partially through it. Maybe that's a good question. We're not, we've not quite established, it is a good question, it's just the fear of time. Um, I think when I say what I'm about to say, you'll see. The next phase is what, and by the way, this is my understanding of Hegel, this is my reading, it's my interpretation. I'm going to do five phases, but I've run it across experts who think it makes a lot of sense and it's a great teaching tool. Okay? After duality and after we've had the struggle to the death, we get an establishment of power. We get an establishment of power and then we have what I like to call the standard process. And that's, for example, the hundreds of years of Trump, the at least 200 years now of triumph of capitalism. A Marxist might say, right? Ever since the Industrial Revolution and so forth, and the death of the kings and queens, and the establishment of neoliberal democracy as an outcome of Enlightenment values at the end of the 18th century, we've had capital win. And we're still in the throes of capital, yes? And I don't mean Marxist capital, I mean the real capital, Wall Street, money, corporations. Yes? That's the standard process. That's the process of oppression. That's the process of just the power structures that are still in place. Okay? Standard process is just um, power <coughs> in position by the winner. Who's the oppressor? Who, as examples, is the white man, the rich white man, okay? The rich white man, to combine all these three. The rich white man is the impositor of power, and he oppresses everyone else. And that can last for hundreds of years. Simone de Beauvoir sort of was part of the start of the feminist movement, which did change things. Some things are radically different from the way your grandmothers, what kind of life your grandmothers had. Um, but in some regards, it hasn't changed all that much, etc. But that's a discussion for another time, not for today. Okay, you can go read Second Sex, you can take courses in feminism, etc., which is all great. And I cover it, you can go into some of my intro lectures. I'm going to cover Simone de Beauvoir in, a, in two lectures. Only talk about her. Um, okay. Standard process. That's how, that's, and, and what's confusing, and I think what was my main confusing Aurora, is when people say class struggle, and when Chomsky talked about class struggle, it, that's standard process. We've already established a hierarchy. It's like the manifestation, like yes. the actual consequences of that? Okay. Yes, it's the actual consequences, it's the manifestation of the struggle to the death. <laughs> One has imposed its power, and now we have, for example, famously class struggle. So class struggle or sex struggle, however you want to put that, are um, examples of this. Okay, but is that it? Are we, ask Hegel, you know, are we just going to forever stay that way? And now we have to go back to Hegel's story. And I have to concretize the story. I have two more phases. <coughs> the next phase, Hegel, I mean I call, inversion. This is another key phase. 
Hegel says in his little story, he talks about the bondsman or the slave working for the master. And the standard process is that the slave, the master feels like he's on top of the world because he has all his needs attended to by the slave. Um, he has the total um, attention and recognition of the slave, etc. Whereas the slave, under standard process, feels totally overwhelmed, beat down, um, has to do all the work, you know, backbreaking work forever and ever. Um, you know, 16-hour days, sleeps three hours a night, then washes clothes, etc. Um, so that's the, the standard process. But, but says Hegel, then something funny starts happening. And this is Hegel's favorite. What starts happening is that the slave, in working, starts realizing that, I'm going to use someone of a was model, that her work is worth something. The slave starts realizing as she continues working that she's actually producing something. And she starts getting meaning from her production. This is a very puritanical, if you haven't noticed, this is a very um, Northern European way of thinking about work, but that's the model Hegel has, and I think that's the model American society roughly has too. So the work products get, start giving meaning to the slave. Not only that, but the master starts realizing that he is dependent on the slave. So the master starts realizing that he, he couldn't even survive without the slave. And that he actually doesn't have as much control as he thought because he relies on her. And this is where the famous phrase, the slave is freer than the master, comes from. Because the, the master realizes that they're kind of screwed without the slave. Okay. So, and here's a, maybe something else to add. One thing Hegel talks a lot about is recognition. We all want recognition. We all want attention, a, a combination of attention, empathy, love, affection from others, yes? And, but the interesting thing Hegel thinks is it doesn't, it can come from others, but it can also indirectly at least come from work, our artistic creation are the books we write, the novels, the, 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 the sonnets we write in poetry, and the, the symphonies we write or may not compose, etc. Okay, so that recognition can come from our work too, not just from um, somebody else. So then, what, yeah, so then what happens is that this weird moment comes where the slave is freer than the master. And then Hegel has this kind of, uh, call it optimistic belief, that what ends up happening is that each of the two individuals, there's another important concept here, the other. A rich white man versus the other. This is where the concept of alienation, etc., comes from in Marx, too. The other is that which is different from the oppressed. So think of rich versus poor, white versus non-white. Pick your favorite non-white race, as it were. Man as opposed to woman, or hermaphrodite, or pick your favorite non-male, or even let go of the binary, if you dare. Um, and so what ends up happening is that they both start realizing that the other is like them. See? That the slave starts realizing that they're worth something and starts seeing that look in the eyes of the master that the master is not under control anymore. Is, is, is not under control of his own situation anymore. That the master might be a little bit afraid that the master might now actually more than ever want to seek the affection, the love, the, the empathy from the slave. And the master might realize, hey, I'm not so hot after all. I'm not so great after all. 
and the slave has something to offer me through the work, but maybe I should start recognizing her as an absolute entity on their own too. And that's the last phase that I call resolution. So the inversion is the slave is freer than the master. The slave gets meaning and recognition from her work. And, and then with the inversion too, there starts being a mutual recognition Each is like the other. And here I put other with a small o, because it's not the absolute other that he will talk about. The absolute other is the, the slave. And here what I'm talking about is the slave is, re the slave realizes the master is like the slave, and the master realizes that the slave is like the master. You see that? It's a symmetrical relationship. And then you end up with a resolution. And this resolution is when they start, they form a greater whole. They work together. Now this Marx didn't like so much because he didn't believe it. He did think sort of the revolution had to be violent. And you had to overthrow the proletariat, uh, the bourgeoisie. Yes? Now, Simone de Beauvoir, for, I guess, obvious reasons, unless you believe in Handmaid's Tale and, and uh, Parthenogenesis, um, thought that we, well, we do need males for, <laughs> for co-creation, etc. But also, even, that males are actually kind of cool if they could just get their act together. <laughs> That's part of what Simone de Beauvoir says in her book. Um, but they have a long way to go, those Neanderthals. Okay. So, but what Simone de Beauvoir does totally accept Hegel's model and then think that there's a greater whole that can be made in the end. And there can be a working together. There's a lot of information, I know. There's an FAQ on Hegel that I've uploaded to eCommons and it's also on my website where I explain this in more detail. I try to give you sort of a, some simple explanations of the model. Questions? There's much more to say, but yes. Say your name? Lindsay. Lindsay. Doesn't that start the, the first process of community? Thank you so much. What an excellent question. Yes. Did you see that or did you know that? Uh, Are you just saying it? I, For yeah. the first time? Yeah. This is the first time you see this? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> You seem very confused or upset or annoyed. No, I <laughs> Exactly. Very well seen. That's exactly right. You reboot. You start over again. It's a recursive fable. Because once you have one kind of hole, nature likes to divide. There, nature is intrinsically this weird dialectic of unity and diversity of singleness and dualism. And you go back to, where was it? You go back to unity. And then you divide some other way. Maybe it's not, so Hegel's fable is totally general, but maybe now we're gonna divide by, um, gosh, what planet we're from. I don't know, I'm thinking like Star Trek or something. <laughs> like, what, well, <laughs> I'm sure the human species has no lack of imagination of how to divide. Ourselves and hierarchy. <laughs> and we're very good at it. Yes. But yeah, that's right. Goes back. Thank you. Yes. Well seen, Lindsay. Yeah. Other comments? Yes, in the back. Say your name? Uh, Maria. Maria. I'll ask you this because at the beginning you said it was like a spiral, and now it seems more like a cycle. Good. 
different heights. It's a spiral because you, and I'm so happy you bring this out because this goes. Let me it should come out of the board too. See, what, what happens is, Hegel thinks once you've gone through the process, this kind of process, for one kind of thing, then there's the next level that you now have to go through. And I'll give you one example which may or may not help. I, hope, I think it'll help some of you. Hegel used this model throughout many of his books. And so he has a whole history of, sorry, he has a whole philosophy of religion, philosophy of right, right in German, so it's, it's law. Philosophy of law, Rechtslehren in German. Um, uh, he has a philosophy of religion, a philosophy of history. And so what he thinks is, for example, we start, what's the most simple religion you can imagine? Hegel does sort of this ranking of religions. What's the most simple religion you can imagine? If you're going to be Hegel and you put yourself in this hierarchical mode. Any thoughts? Math? What? Atheism? Math? Math? No, 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 no. Like, like, paganism? Yeah, something like, exactly. So paganism or animism. Yes. So Hegel roughly thinks something like animism, where you think that like, um, there are spirits like, no, it's not even just animism, it's sort of like spiritualism, or where you just think like everything has spirits. And that there's just like this force or this like energy everywhere. So he thinks like that's like the most simple thing where every rock and every tree and every snake has, um, has some spirit or something. And then he says, so that's, and he then cites some examples of cultures in the world, even when he was writing, that were animist. And then he says, well, that's one thesis. But then there's an antithesis which says, well, not everything can have spirit because spirit is like too, too pure or it's too, um, too important to be like everything. It has to be more constrained or something. And then you have um, animism where spirit, there is spirit, and, but it's only in animals. Rocks and trees don't have spirit. And then he sort of does this progression of how you go from um, let me just quickly look at my notes here. So for example, he goes from a progression. <coughs> from animistic, then, uh, or, or pantheist and animistic, then polytheistic. Because what's the next phase after that, can you imagine? Yeah, but so we're not agree at a monotheism. But now you have to abstract. Everything is always like an act of abstraction. Now you abstract away from like snakes and, 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 and tigers, and you say that actually it's up there. <laughs> that spirit is like lives as figures who are not imaginary, but they're not material either. So you have Greek mythology, you have Norse mythology, you have um, Hindu mythology where you start having these figures that are sort of anthropomorphized, but not completely. And um, well, you asked the place you really don't make. That's fine. This is where I wanted to go. I don't have anything else in the discussion, and we're asking questions. Um, and uh, so you upload, but then the antithesis to that is, no, but that can't be right. That's too messy. I mean, there's got to be one total force who's also like not material and who exists and in the ideal and then you get the monotheism and every stage you go through you so you go through this phase these these stages but with religion rather than with race class or gender I'd have to think about how to do it with race, class, or gender. But it, yeah, we want to deal with class. Remember, Marx thought that there were four phases. There was the ancient phase, the feudal phase, the capitalist phase, and the socialist phase. And all of those he tells the story, how you go between them with the master-slave dialectic. And now would be a good time to end. Thank you. Uh, the FAQ. Uh,